When we last met our dynamic duo, the deposed King James II, who was a Catholic, was fighting the Protestant William of Orange for the English throne in Ireland. There was a terrible battle in Ockram, County Galway, where William won out. But let's go back a step and look quickly at something that I didn't know about anyway, the tradition of Irish soldiers on the continent. The first Irish troops to serve as a unit for continental power formed an Irish regiment in the Spanish army in the 80 years war starting in the 1590s. The regiment had been raised by an English Catholic, William Stanley in Ireland from native Irish soldiers and mercenaries whom the English authorities wanted out of the country. Stanley was given a commission by Elizabeth I and he was intended to lead his regiment on the English side in support of the Dutch United Provinces. However, in 1585, motivated by religious factors and maybe a few bribes offered by Spaniards, Stanley defected to the Spanish side with his regiment. In 1598, Diego Braquero de Anaya wrote to the Spanish king, Philip III, saying that every year your highness should order to recruit in Ireland some Irish soldiers who are people tough and strong and nor the cold weather or bad food could kill them easily as they would with the Spanish, as in their island, which is much colder than this one. They are almost naked. They sleep on the floor and eat oats, bread, meat and water without drinking any wine. <sighs> so apparently us Irish were real tough guys. One century later, in 1691, this would be tested as the remains of the decimated Irish army took refuge within the walls of Limerick, where the supporters of James II who had been deserted by him, underwent a siege. Eventually, a truce was called for. Patrick Sarsfield took on the role of chief negotiator for the Irish, while Ginkel negotiated on behalf of William of Orange. So on the 3rd of October 1691, Patrick Sarsfield signed the Treaty of Limerick. It promised that Catholics would remain free to practice their religion, and it gave legal protection to any of James's army who were willing to stay in Ireland and give an oath of loyalty to the Protestant King William and Queen Mary. The treaty also agreed to Sarsfield's demand that those still serving in James's army could leave for France. Popularly known in Ireland as the Flight of the Wild Geese, the process began almost immediately using English ships sailing from Cork French ships completed it by December. Modern estimates suggest that around 19,000 soldiers and rapparees departed. A small number of accompanying women and children brought that figure to slightly over 20,000, or about 1% of Ireland's population. A legend has it that women who couldn't travel with their loved ones assembled on the shore to see their men depart on the ships. As the ships sailed away, the women waded into the water to try and catch a last glimpse, a final look as the ships went over the horizon. And they sang a beautiful air, which has now entered the tradition as Nagena Fiona, or the wild geese. It was only fitting that this event was commemorated with a lament. Despite the clear terms outlined in the Treaty of Limerick, just a few years after its signing, the English established the Penal Laws, which heavily discriminated against and oppressed all Catholics. In the following centuries, Irish soldiers and their descendants would go on to distinguish themselves in Flanders, Spain, Brussels, the Americas, the Napoleonic Wars, Italy and Austria. 
an Austrian descendant of the O'Donnells of Chirchunnel, called Maximilian Graf O'Donnell von Chirchunnel, saved the life of Emperor Franz Joseph I during an assassination attempt in the 1800s. And Irish soldiers had a 125-year-old military tradition in France, which ended only with the siege of Antwerp. So now I'd like to play you Nagaina Fianna in honour of those thousands of people who have to leave their home and do their best to survive. <laughs> 